that's essentially it. He's like, you never have belonged here. We've let you in because of historical issues that have gone on and you've managed to get in here. But, you know, you're not British and don't ever feel comfortable in the knowledge in, in, that, you, that you're never going to be removed. Britain for the past 21 years has been overtaken by what can only be described as a national hysteria. The recent jaw-dropping investigation by the New York Times serial podcast into the so-called Trojan horse affair in Birmingham revealed how this hysteria translated into a deep-seated national display of Islamophobia. If you haven't heard it yet, it's certainly worth a listen, but in many ways it no more than confirmed what the Muslim community already knows. We have become accustomed to hearing on an almost daily basis lazy and malicious tropes about an Islamic threat, dressed as thoughtful research and media analysis. At the height of the war on terror, there was a bipartisan consensus with both Labour and a Conservative Party queuing up to talk with infantile rhetoric about the end of multiculturalism, the so-called Muslim problem in our midst, segregated communities, entryism and Islam's inability to modernise. Listeners to this podcast will note from discussions with previous guests an anti-Islam industry has developed, with academics feeding think tanks and in turn feeding journalists and politicians, all complicit in nurturing an atmosphere and language to enable some of the most draconian anti-terror laws in the Western world. Even the United States was unable to pass a fraction of what repeated British Home Secretaries have called for. This is not merely a Conservative Party problem, or one limited to the right-wing press. Islamophobia pervades British public life. As Baroness Saida Warsi recently said, Muslim hatred has passed the dinner party test as an acceptable form of conversation. My guests today have been for the past 20 years at the forefront of pushing back against the security state. Fahad Ansari is a lawyer and public activist who in his professional career has defended many Muslims who have fallen foul of Britain's nationality laws, including very high profile cases of citizenship deprivation. He recently won a landmark case of a British Muslim of Bangladeshi descent who had his passport unlawfully revoked whilst visiting his wife in his father's country. Fahad regularly appears on national and international news channels and is called upon to provide expert evidence to international institutions. Dr. Rob Forwalker is an academic and author specialising in critiquing Britain's anti-terror education policies, also known as PREVENT. He has recently published a brilliant book looking at the language of extremism and radicalisation and became interested in the subject after his experience in an East London school where he witnessed the detrimental policies of the state on young Muslims firsthand. I've just ordered your book, uh, Rob, actually. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought I need to read this. Uh, especially, I, just, I was listening to the, the, um, the Trojan horse stuff. Haven't yeah. read it yet, but I said, you know, I, I've got to read Rob's book now. <laughs> to link yeah. It. yeah, well, it was all, it was all very, I mean, that's what I mean, it's, it was all, it's all very close to home. And I, I really, uh, I mean, recognising that I'm a white observer of, 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 of something that wasn't being directed at me, but as a teacher in Tower Hamlets, um, it was so close to home because I could um, see all of that, 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 deceit i guess kept being directed at the schools in tower hamlets very quickly afterwards um so yeah and then and then i'd also i'd actually met quite a lot of the characters involved because before i was kind of frozen out of policy discussions i was on the tower hamlets overview and scrutiny committee and to prevent um and even spent spent a day going up to birmingham to meet with birmingham council to be um have all of this to explain which is an extraordinary thing because it was i mean it was it was even then it was it was implicit that this this letter was a fake but everyone was just literally you know honestly a whole day talking to the council and talking to west Midlands, midlands police acting reacting to the letter that they knew was fake it was extraordinary yeah i mean i'm, I'm just on i think i started episode six this morning and uh, there is that sort of tension when hamza writes that letter and then he kicks off and it's um it, I drew parallels to my own experience working in, in the legal industry and when you're working in national security cases 
and you have barristers uh, sometimes who, who just don't quite get it. And uh, it's very hard because they're, they're always arguing in a very, uh, I guess you have to be um, sort of just not detached away from the reality. But then for us who have that lived experience of what this all means, it's not just a client and somebody who's lost their citizenship or who's been subject to these measures based on their beliefs. I mean, every time the, the discussion of Salafi or Salafi beliefs comes up and they have, you know, good Salafi, bad Salafi type discussion, it's so excruciating just to sit there and, and have to observe this and, and listen and hear your own belief system just be debated about whether it's something to be acceptable or not. And, you know, I'm sitting in the room with thinking, look, I, I believe in a lot of this and, uh, you know, what's the problem? But uh, it, it is that sort of detachment and, you know, well, you can't say that. And I, I don't know, well, why not? Um, so you do have that. And uh, and you see that publicly, but I, I'm, I'm quite critical and open about my criticism about SIAC and about the process on Twitter and, and my, my written pieces. Um, many others in the legal industry will not be so blatant because it's sort of seen that, well, you can't attack the system so, so much. You can't attack, you can attack the government, but not the judicial process that's up to deal with this because it is independent and you know I, I i i have problems with that when you hear lord reed in the supreme court telling judges you need to give due respect to the assessment of the home secretary on on these matters i certainly want to ask fahad about citizenship deprivation but just on prevent um uh, now of course a lot of uh, our listeners may not be familiar with the prevent program can, can you just talk us through what prevent is yeah so so it's so the prevent policy is it's it's part of the uk government's counter terrorism strategy and it's interested in finding in identifying people who would be regarded as as extremists and and you know i'm, I'm putting my things up here for heavy scare quotes around extremism because it's a, it's an absurd com concept but they're, they're seeking out extremists and, and you hear when you talk to civil servants you hear them talking about things like going going upstream from the terrorist attack or or seeking out to fight you know see, seeking out what what what's going on before the bomb goes off um and so they're really that so and it, well, the other term that we hear is is the pre-criminal space so this is trying to identify people who've committed a crime before they've even thought about committing a crime um and and the it, it, it's shown up to be particularly absurd because um there is there is a duty for people who who uh, work in in various public services, uh, whether it be in childcare or in schools or in hospitals, to enact the prevent prevent duty. So those people, and I mean upwards, uh, some cal calculations, five million people in the country, maybe more than that, have been tasked and given training to in how to have, and this is the these are the words in to have how to have due regard um, to preventing future acts of terrorism and that's really how this one of one of the mechanisms that that makes this work is that it's all based on these kind of what if scenarios that i've i've been attacked quite a lot by um civil servants by local government officials for speaking out against prevent and a fairly frequent line of attack is that i will i will personally be responsible for future acts of terrorism because i'm undermining prevent can you explain the process to me of of uh, a prevent referral? And so, 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 so the way this works is that you'll you'll have a teacher, or you'll have a doctor, uh, or even a nursery worker, because there have been kids aged four who've been referred to prevent, um, who will um, who will decide that they've seen seen an indicator for extremism. And now there Can are. Give me an example. For, of for an example, I've been told yeah. in prevent training that um, well. You, your your standard standard examples tend to be around kind of um, outward expressions of Islam. So there's a kind of real fetish for the, for the hijab, as we know, kind of generally across across society, across Western society generally. So there's a kind of fetish for for what what Muslim women wear. Um, there's a kind of there's an there's an interest in in uh, young men growing beards. That could be a sign. Um, uh, going back to the sort of the Salafi point, short trousers. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing. I mean, you've got, I mean, it's incredibly sinister, but you've got to laugh. It's ridiculous. Yes. Um, uh, what else have I been told? Um, I had one very early tr prevent training that I had in the school. I was told that um, 
it could be a sign um, of if, if a kid's grades start going down, that could be a sign of extremism. And <laughs> later in the same trade, I was told that if the kid's grades go up, it could be a sign of extremism. <laughs> um, and um, and you, and you get you get sort of counter terrorism police giving briefings where they tell the tell the public to to trust their gut. Um, and 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 actually, it's worth breaking that down because the the police, for for all of their ineptitude, have apparently been spending the last two hundred years trying to be, trying to be evidence based. Trying to, you know, the police gather evidence on crimes and try and work out who is, you know, use a use a rational approach to work out who has committed a crime. Uh, and so, so it's telling telling the public to trust their guts totally undermines what policing ought to be about. So anyway, so once you've once you've identified the kid with the kid whose grades have gone down and gone up, and he's wearing short trousers and he's thinking about growing a beard, um, you then um, uh, you then apply your and, and, and what that telling people to trust their gut, telling telling a British group of people to trust their gut is basically saying allow your racism to guide what you are going to say now. Okay, so 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 you you've enabled people's racism. You now say, okay, we're going to listen to your racism, and um, and then you uh, so you would then go to the prevent lead within your organisation, whether that be a university, a school, or a hospital. And you'd have a conversation with the prevent lead, and they would then decide whether this is worth pursuing, or whether, whether, that's a bad, a bad word actually, because pursue is another branch of cancer terrorism. But whether it's wor worth referring up to um, cancer, to the police, and so they would then pick up the phone. They they phone up uh, the lo uh, the local prevent lead, probably involved the police as well. And then the ne next stage, if they decide that it's worth investigating this person, then the next thing we know, they know is that um, the police will come on, knock on someone's door, they'll come to the school to interview the kid. Um, and this is one of the, in fact, it's the only thing, the only time that I've been in policy conversations within schools or with other, you know, with, with civil servants outside of schools, where it's been been very very overtly stated that the, the, there may be just cause for the police to interview the child without informing their parents, um, and so yeah, so you 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 can end up with this terrifying situation where the kids being being interviewed by two adult police officers in uniform. Um, about and you and you end up getting kids. I mean, they're they're, they're quite quite well documented by Prevent Watch, which is an organisation that documents a lot of a lot of these referrals. Um, you get the incidents where where you'll have um, non theologically trained or aware non Muslim police officers quizzing children on their interpretation of the Quran. Um, and again, kind of bringing it back to the Trojan horse, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter that this is all ridiculous. Um, it, it it just it just sort of serves. There's enough bureaucracy around there to justify this direct oppression of of, of young young Muslims. But also, you know, obviously this is this is also played out with adults uh, through doctor surgeries and things like that. I, I, I want to uh, qu quickly bring Fahad in here because Fahad, the argument from the government is that. Uh, this is, uh, you know, it's it's a it's before any legal proceedings take place, a pre-criminal space. Uh, from a lawyer's perspective, I mean, so so in in essence, even even according to uh, what what has been just laid out there by Rob, um, you know, at best there's a conversation with some police officers or for some with some prevent officers, and you know, at best, uh, if that person is on this continuum, uh, he or she may. Uh, may be uh, may may be convinced not to uh, pursue uh, their uh, their so called ambitions, extremist ambitions. So, what's the harm if it's if it's a pre criminal space? I mean, what's your thoughts on that, Fahad? I think Rob alluded to this at the beginning that uh, as a teacher, he was effectively doing prevent work without without the toxicity of prevent around it, where his students, if they were concerned about political uh, events around the world or if they had 
a desire to travel abroad to engage in violent conflict, they would discuss it with him and he would give them his risk assessment and tell them whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. And they've had that discussion. Um, when you break in, put on a statutory footing and you bring police officers in and you bring the whole militarized arm of the state, you sort of take away that um, that cooperation, that trust, that confidence, and you are treating people as suspects and as criminals before they've actually um, done or anything. It's essentially thought crime, what, what you're dealing with. And in fact, it's not even thought crime, it, it's, it's a process of getting to thought crime because it's criminalizing that thought process itself. Um, so that just goes towards the effective, effectiveness of it. As Rob said, his students fall and prevent clammed up. They don't speak, they don't talk to him anymore uh, as he may have done in the past because they feel then he's got an obligation to go to the police or the authorities about this. And then they completely devastate and destroy their, their lives, their futures, their careers, everything they've, they've dreamed of. Um, so an, an effective it doesn't work. Uh, on a legal basis, obviously, once it's put into to statute and it's law, then, then it is a lawful duty and it, it would be unlawful not to do that. But uh, ultimately, as, as a, going back to you know, first principles here, is that it does it, does, it, does, it, does it lead us to a safer society? Does it lead us to, uh, to protect our people from getting involved in what quote unquote extremism? Um, and my, my point is it doesn't, it just drives people in the other direction. Um, we have a criminal justice system. We have the broadest anti-terror laws and powers in the Western hemisphere. We have powers where you can successfully arrest, charge and prosecute and convict an individual for downloading a map or for booking a, a plane ticket to Turkey. And yet if that's not, I mean, not bad enough, but then you want to basically criminalize somebody for even having the thought of downloading that map or thinking of going to Turkey or expressing a, a viewpoint about the political situation. I mean, just yesterday, um, I read these headlines about um, Nadim Zahawi, the education secretary, saying that children shouldn't be criticizing Boris Johnson in school. I mean, how ridiculous a society are we going? I mean, it is laughable at the same time. This is the, the, the path towards authoritarianism where the education secretary is saying that children should not be criticizing the prime minister in school. Yeah, I mean, that's, I saw that yesterday. I mean, I'm laughing because because it is ridiculous, and it, but it's, I'm also sort of laughing nervously because it's terrifying. It, it really is terrifying to you. I mean, my understanding of being a teacher was that I was, a big job was to teach the children to be critical of the state. I mean, that's, that's got to be fundamental to any education process. And, and actually, I mean, not, not wanting to go into kind of the ins and outs of, of British education policy over the last 20 years, but we have seen this shift away from that um there's been a very a, you know very hard shift under well in, not not surprisingly led by michael gove who was the he, he was the ring leading politician around the trojan horse affair um but actually just just on, on the talking about um how prevent disrupts what was disrupts the work that they're tr that they're already trying to do in terms of kind of having these conversations and and, and protecting people from making bad decisions um, I, I want to just pick out one very specific example from, from the kids I used to teach. And that was, um, so I did end up, after I then started speaking out about Prevent, a lot, a lot of kids started coming and talking to me a bit more about their frustrations with Prevent. Um, so in a way, for me, those conversations opened up again. Um, and, and in fact, I ended up, I, I'd often have, I'd have kind of whole lunch times where I'd have kids that I'd never met before. So I taught in a large school about 2,000 children who'd come and knock on my classroom door and come and talk, talk to me at lunchtime about, about their frustrations because there wasn't really anyone else in the school who they, they trusted to talk about for them. Um, uh, and, that, and actually, well, that's, that's an important point, actually, because that's despite a significant portion of the staff body of the school being Muslim. So e even amongst Muslims, it, it silences debate. Um, and, and I've, you know, I've had this conversation with, with, you know, with, 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 you know, thoughtful Muslim teachers, with imams who found it difficult to have those conversations because of prevent. Um, and um, so, spe spell that out. Why? Why would a Muslim teacher say, you know, you're a Muslim student, you um, 
uh, you're confused about the world. Why wouldn't you approach a Muslim teacher and uh, to talk about your thoughts? Because, and... because this, I mean, this is the, again, this is, uh, yeah, it's interesting, uh, this this point, that it's important to talk about the the kind of power structures that are innate in French. So first of all, you've got the legal duty. So there's a legal mm. duty for teachers to follow prevent. So they have to, right. if they if they see a sign of extremism, they have to report um, report report the student. Um, now, bear in mind that report, I suppose there's, there's, a, there's a way that enables them to do that without, with, without where, and, and perhaps fooling themselves, they're not, not causing so much harm, is that the first point of referral is, is a referral within the organisation, so within the school. So it might just be a conversation with another teacher. Um, but they, you do have, you do have that, that, yeah, you do have that, that legal duty. Um, the other point is that that there is a there is always played out this this what if scenario. So you talked before about this kind of continuum that's imagined from from you know from having a having a supposedly extreme thought to to running over some pedestrians. That's kind of the, the continuum that that is imagined, and it's very important to keep saying that this is imagined. You can in the same way that that minor, minority report with Tom Cruise is science fiction because we don't have a way of predicting the future. That continuum is imagined. It's not. It doesn't exist. Um, but but it's but but it's still even though it doesn't exist, it still plays out in people's minds these what if scenarios, and that's very much the the kind of tenor of the um, of the prevent training that people have to go through in all of these organisations. Um, and also, if you question prevent, as I have a lot, as I said at the start of this this conversation, if you question prevent, you you find yourself frequently told that you will be responsible for future acts of terror. So there's a real there's this this kind of national security what if scenario. So if what if if you don't if you don't report that child who's who's now started praying five times a day, um, then that then 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 they go off they they commit an act of terrorism then it's your fault for not having having referred them um even though the, the, again the continuum has been kind of imagined and you and, and in fact all any research that's been done on this which i'm, I'm not particularly interested in because actually i just think preventing this whole structure is 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 wrong but even you know research that's been done with this shows that 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 religious observance is actually a protective characteristic against going committing acts of violence, um, which kind of is self-evident. <laughs> um, but um, going back to the the, the a, a very specific example around how this affects children is that in those conversations that I then started having with kids who were critical of prevent, um, one child that I knew quite well um, came to me and he said he said. I just want to get this off my chest. I want to talk to you about what's been going on for the last six months. And what had been going on for the last six months is that this is back in, I guess, about 2017. Um, and it was a time when there was, you know, to be, to be fair on kind of pro-government people, there was at the time quite a lot of kind of like call, call of duty type aesthetic ISIS propaganda was going around on social media. Um, yeah, that let's recognise that that exists. Um, and and so so yeah, so those aren't where so Call of Duty being this you know online shoot them up and mm -hmm. the ISIS propaganda machine because they had quite a good media organisation um, was creating kind of videos and uh, and memes that showed you know showed showed the uh, showed showed the Islamic State in a um uh with that kind of iconography um and that was that was trying to be used to encourage young young muslims to travel there young muslim men um anyway this kid that i was came to talk to me said i want to get this off my chest um we have him and four mates have spent the last six months worried about a friend of ours because he's been spending a lot of time playing call of duty online and he's also been looking at like at these videos he's been sharing the memes on social media um so so but but we, we we've been worried about him the kid said but we haven't been able to do anything we haven't been able to contact any adults and this this speaks to muslims not being involved as well we haven't been able to speak to any adults so we haven't been able to speak to our parents we haven't been able to speak to any teachers because if we do we know that they will have a duty 
to intervene and, and report this to the state, which, however much Prevent is dressed up as being this supportive programme, it is not. In that instance, I've got no doubt that that child would have been charged. They would have had, I mean, Fahad would be able to say better what would have happened to them, but, but their life would have been ruined. Um, and so these four kids, um, I was told, had spent um, six months, six months. They'd together, they'd drawn up a timetable every day of the week for what was happening after school without their friend knowing about it, without their parents knowing about it. They'd drawn up a timetable so that every afternoon after school, at least one of them or, or a few of them were taking this other kid out, their mate out to play football. They were, they were, they were taking him around to their houses, houses for tea. They were doing all sorts of different things with a, like an incredibly intense intervention that they were leading, where they made sure that this kid was spending less time playing Call of Duty. He was more engaged with their friendship group and they were protecting him. They were making sure that he wasn't affected by that. Now, the tragedy is that they couldn't, I mean, it, I'm, I'm sort of welling up as I'm thinking about this because it upsets me so much. Mm -hmm. They couldn't seek any adult support in that situation because of prevent. Because of prevent, they couldn't seek support to help their friend. Now, I just was told at the end of it that they were they were confident that their friend was okay. And they and even after they had done that and they and they had, had protected their friend, and even after we'd had these kind of lengthy conversations, you know, we, we very much trusted each other, they couldn't dare tell me. They couldn't tell me who it was, um, because that kid wouldn't be safe if they told if they told me. Um and yeah, and it's just a tragedy. It's just, it, it, it's absolutely tragic, and it's. I mean, it just speak that story for me. Just speaks of how dysfunctional prevent is, and how dysfunctional it is for a society to create something like. But that. but surely, I mean, Fahad, surely then the government uh, there have been multiple reviews into prevent. Um, we know just from the statistics that the number of reports versus the number of of uh, referrals upstream and then criminal offences uh, that may be pursued as a result are, you know, that's di it's disproportionate. Um, surely then the government should have realised, would have realised that prevent uh, is, a, is a failed policy and it's not supported by large numbers of Muslims. Uh, or do you feel that there is a, a broader objective at play here and, and it's really not about preventing extremism in inverted commas, but but something else that the government is trying to achieve. Um, I mean, it, it's clear, isn't it? it it's it, whether it's the, the, the Trojan hoax incident um, or this this latest issue with prevent. It is in pursuance of an, another agenda. It's not about protecting Britain. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, that's just chilling. What Rob just said um, that really is chilling. The, what you said about children concerned about one of their own being involved in, in, in something that we're all sort of, I think, agree that, that they, they shouldn't be, and so scared for his safety that they're taking all that burden on their own shoulders because the government has made it impossible for them to approach an adult. Um, and and w w when I say that, uh, Jalal, about how it's not about protecting us, I've had clients who've been, um, you know, convicted of terrorism, and, um, and when, I, when I say terrorism, it, it's it's stuff about not about plotting anything, it's about stuff they said maybe 15, 20 years ago at the height of the Iraq war um, that, you know, they got done for inciting terrorism or glorifying terrorism, stuff like this. People who have influence in the communities and who got short sentences, but nonetheless, they are considered convicted terrorists, but who still have that influence amongst people in their communities and amongst youngsters in particular. And they, in their own personal private space, get approached by individuals about stuff like Daesh, about other issues around the world, and they do their best to dissuade people um, and give their opinion and give them the Islamic uh, principles about these issues. And they complain regularly to me that the police, the counterterrorism police, the MI5, um, are always on the case for them to uh, work for them. Look, why can't you just, you're doing it anyway, why don't you just do it on, under our banner? So you'd be really good. We both have a shared agenda. We both are looking to protect. And they don't seem to understand that his entire uh, sphere of influence will, will completely diminish if it ever comes out that he has any sort of relationship with the state. And they won't accept this. I've had meetings with prevent officers where they have 
approached uh, a charity that I'm closely affiliated with, helping households under great stress called HUGS. And the HUGS is there and we, we provide, um, I mean, I, it's, not, it's not a secret, I'm one of the trustees. And we provide support to families of people who have been impacted by counterterrorism legislation, policies and measures. So that's primarily after the, the wives, the children um, left behind. Now, beneficiaries have stopped taking our calls at times. And then when we've sort of found out, they said they got contacted by Prevent and they said that if you take assistance from hugs, it's going to basically it could lead to problems. You might you need to have an intervention. Uh, which is quite really, really sinister, actually, to tell a family in need that a charity and a support group set up uh, which shares their sort of faith and their uh, emotion, uh, there to cater to their emotional needs, uh, as well as financial and material needs, um, that they should stop taking support from them. So I, on the back of one of these incidents, I contacted the prevent officer and I said, could you come into my office? I'd like to have a meeting with you. And we had a meeting and then I said, well, what seems to be the issue? Because all that the charity is doing is it's providing them with that, that support. Oh, but, um, and and he, he gave a very bizarre analogy. He said, look, um, it's like uh, if you had a, a situation where somebody was involved with, uh, with drug abuse and you have a, there's, there's various volunt voluntary groups out there who want to help that person who's involved with, who is suffered from um, drug addiction. But then you have one body which the government has endorsed and is funding is approving to assist them in their recovery. So is it not better for the government for them to work with that? I said, well, would you tell the other, would you tell them that it's going to be the be problem for them if they actually went to one of the other NGOs who are helping in the sector. I mean it just seems like you want to have the monopoly on this in a very, very sinister manner. It's one thing marketing your product and competing that we offer better services, but it's a second thing to actually, you know, in almost mafia type tactics, intimidate all the other opposition out of this. And 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 clearly you if if you offer services to help someone, it's up to them to go to you. But to make it mandatory for them to go to you at the expense of everybody else. And, you know, no one's profiting out of this. It's essentially a charity providing support to someone. So that's why I go back to the point is I, it's not about keeping Britain safe. It's not about protecting us from a threat. It's about, um, you know, as Rob put it, it's a Salafi phobia. Maybe it's, and I go beyond Salafi, Rob, to be honest. It's about any, uh, any sort of Muslim space or Muslim ideology let's see where you think beyond the private sphere so where, where where a muslim wants to allow his or her religion and his or her, their ideology to influence how they interact in the public sphere that becomes a problem so it's okay for you to pray at home go to the mosque fast in ramadan but the moment you want to bring that into the public sphere whether that be uh Ramadan policies in your office or in your school or if it, it influences how you engage with the political system in this country or your thought about government policies at home and abroad if that's influenced by your 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 faith then that's a problem and that has become sort of the 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 equivalence of extremism whether they blatantly describe it as not this is your your structural Islamophobia which is at the root of all of this, um, and and they 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 you know what they they don't admit it. Uh, I think a point is coming where they will admit it, because they have no shame. <laughs> this government lacks any shame, and it's one 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 of the benefits of this is that it is completely. I mean, I I, I don't think they're they've been accused of lacking transparency. I don't think they're very transparent about how they feel about Muslims, about how they feel about the rest of the country. I think their behavior is is very indicative of. Of how they feel you know the reason that they want the the they want people that hugs are helping to be to be with prevent and not with hugs is that is i think was re revealed in that infamous um amber rudd rudd question time response when i can't remember what it was what it was after but amber rudd who is the british home secretary a few years ago who got got slightly flustered in a in a on an online panel show uh, sorry, in a TV panel panel show, and and said that prevent is where we get the intelligence from. Uh, so I think that's her exact was her, her exact words. 
Um, and I think that I think that really does reveal what's actually going on here. You know, we're told frequently that prevent is separate from security services. Prevent is not is not an intelligence gathering tool. That's clearly a lie. I mean, it it it, it clearly is um, intel an intelligence gathering tool. Tool, and that and that's why the government wants people to be going through prevent. What you know, um, but in terms going going back to the, I wanted to address a couple of points there. One was the the failed policy, and the you know prevent is a failed policy on the terms that it is described, but I think it actually works perfectly for what it's meant to do. And what it's meant to do is it is meant to, uh, it's meant to define bad people and show that the government are opposed to them, are being tough on them. I, I'm, I'm interested in, in drawing parallels between your work rather uh, about on, on prevent and, and the research you've done. And, and of course, uh, the Trojan horse affair that we, uh, we talked about earlier, um, and and your last comment there. I mean, do you feel that there is a a very overt policy to to almost mute, to self censor, uh, to create self censorship within the Muslim community, but also to mould the attitudes of Muslims, in particular young Muslims, in in terms of how they should represent themselves in the public sphere. So. If, for example, Muslims, you know, in the case of, of Birmingham, Muslims, uh, they, they come together and decide that they're going to uh, turn around their local schools on, and they have an, an Islamic ethos and they want to inculcate an Islamic ethos as a means to improve in the educational outcomes of, of their young, of the, of the young uh, boys and girls in, in uh, young pupils in these schools. If that is untenable, then within time, the Muslim community would have to strip its, its public um, uh, connections with Islam in order to, uh, in order to achieve their interests in, in, in British society. And, and, and how much can we, can we argue that this is an explicit um, uh, objective of policies like prevent? That's, I mean, that's the, 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 the interesting point there is, 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 is it explicit? Um, and I suppose it is because David Cameron, the former British Prime Minister, gave numerous speeches where he talked about, um, you know, the death of multiculturalism. Multiculturalism, you know, is, is a failed experiment. With sort of with the kind of the kind of phrases that he was using in his speeches. Um, so yeah, I think I think that I think you're probably probably right there. And we, that talks to notions of kind of the good and the bad Muslim. The good Muslim being being you know Muslim who doesn't who doesn't. Um, I guess doesn't 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 carry visible characteristics of their faith. Doesn't uh, express their faith in public forums. Um, and the other and the other example, as well as David Cameron's speeches, would be um, uh, Trevor Phillips, who was the what was it? I mean, the, the most absurd role for someone who is so outspoken racial, against kind of racial equality, whole, yeah. whole yeah. tranches of the population. Yeah. Racial equalities. Um, head of was he head of the head of the racial equalities commission? And he had this. Um, he had that show on the infamous show on Channel Four on national TV, talking about I think it was what Muslims think, um, where he just presented it as a problem that there were predominantly Muslim neighbourhoods anywhere in the country, um, and. And I'm mean, not going to go into too much detail on that, but if you look into the surveys that he had. That, that were run for, to support that program, his um, uh, his he totally misrepresents the surveys that were that were done to 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 talk about what Muslims think. Uh, he sort of he 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 does things like he cites how many Muslims uh, support um, violence against the state, so what we would call active terrorism. Um, if you look, if you dig into the data, because it's part of the the survey the, the surveys are published. In fact. Muslims are the cohort within that survey who have the least support for violence against the state. Um, yet he just quotes that out of context to show that, that they do. But that's that's kind of kind of an, an aside. Um, but but Fahad, Fahad I, I mean, I would like to 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 bring you into into this part of the conversation uh, because you've got connections within the Muslim community. You've uh, you've um, worked as you said with hugs and and um, uh, and are connected to organizations like cage and you write for for multiple muslim uh, news organizations so in a way you've got you've got your your finger on the pulse and you know what's happening i mean 
you, in your in your observations, do you feel that um, the Muslim community are falling prey to, if there is an objective, to mute and to mold the attitudes of the Muslim community? That uh, you know the the type of activism uh, you and I uh, probably be remembering in you know the early days of the war on terror. Uh, where where Muslims were were ready to demonstrate and and to protest against the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, is that type of 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 disciplined Islamic activism on the decline? And can you blame then um, these policies like Prevent for for creating that uh, that lack of of um, of a pushback against uh, against you know foreign policy and, and other. Uh, government interventions that harm our community. If you think back to the kind of campaigns and activities the Muslim community were collectively involved in, I'm not talking about any specific organization or group, but there was a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of collective activism um, in the early years of the war on terror, I would say up to the, the London bombings. I think those four or five years uh, were quite quite groundbreaking, the kind of stuff that was being done, the kind of stance that was being taken, even after Tony Blair delivered his rules of the game of change speech, where and Charles Clark, the then Home Secretary, talked about, you know, this is 2005, six type, or no compromise on the caliphate, on Sharia law, as he put it, on, on these issues. Um, so that that's sort of the dynamics. And, and we came together, and there was open letters signed by you know, I think the, the one I remember clearly was signed by about 40 Muslim organizations and personalities from across the spectrum uh, of political thoughts of, across different sects came together to say, well, th these are our red lines and we're going to push back on these. Now, today, you, you try to see that list of organizations and who would actually sign up to it today publicly. It's going to be very, very difficult. And the the net effect of this is that when you get groups like Cage who are still carrying on that struggle and carrying on that fight, according to what everybody was on 15, 16 years ago, they become sort of marginalized and looking like um, the odd ones out, that these guys have something different, whereas everybody else is either silent or complicit. And while even privately people have said to me, well, we really support what Cage does, but it's just not... It's not wise to go out there and say this publicly anymore. This isn't 2004 anymore. This is, you know, 2020. Things have changed. Um, we support it, but we can't publicly support Cage. And you get that. Well, well why not? And mm -hmm. this sort of, sort of, it's, it's, um, you know, Rob was better at, at, at words than me, but you had this sort of split personality where you are privately egging on Cage, saying, yeah, we hope they win in this challenge. And, we really support their challenge against William Shawcross and everything else they're doing, but we can't publicly say that. And we might even publicly denounce them because we need to save our own skin. Um, and we won't do anything even to, to that might look like it's in line with the cage sort of campaigns or agenda. That is extremely damaging. And I do blame this on primarily on, on, on prevent and, and this whole agenda because, because it's so broad and because it's so vague, People are so afraid of falling foul of it that they end up self-censoring, um, and and not you know even where the the government hasn't given a list of, of of speakers that you're not allowed to have. People will think, well, we think he said something that's controversial, and the government might think it's controversial. We're not going to actually have them on our platform. Um, so you have that where where we are censoring ourselves more than the government. So even recently, when this whole debate kicked off about deprivation. And simultaneously, you had the prescription of uh, the Hamas political wing um, what happened around the same time. And there's such a huge discourse in the community and people, senior members of the community, which, you know, were coming and asking me questions like, look, can I travel? Um, would they take my citizenship when I'm abroad? I'm going to uh, Turkey or I'm going to Pakistan. Um, I've said this thing about Palestine in the past. Um, there's a demonstration against citizenship deprivation. If I attend it, will they take my citizenship away? And I'm just completely baffled because the people that I looked up to for inspiration, you know, many years ago, and now they are sort of so risk averse 
in a way that even the legislation, if you interpret it to its broadest, could not be possibly used to stop you. Now, these people are in senior roles, people look up to them, go to them for advice. And that's the kind of messaging that they're spilling over to their crowds. I mean, it, it's really terrifying prospect as, as a father for me to think about what kind of Islam and what kind of self-confidence as Muslims my kids will have growing up because inevitably they're influenced by the communities they're raised in and by what's around them. So you've raised the, uh, the, uh, the current uh, Borders and Nationalities Bill that's going through uh, Parliament and that's been uh, that's attracted a lot of uh, attention, especially in uh, the Muslim community, but also in the wider, I think, wider ethnic minority communities across the UK. Um, I, I know that there was a, a message sent out, for example, by the Sikh community uh, about how problematic this bill is. Now, um, uh, the, the the clause of the bill that uh, makes it easier for the Home Secretary to deprive citizenship has really come under focus. Uh, you've argued, Fahad, that um, uh, contrary to popular opinion, this provision to deprive citizenship has been around for a long time and it has been used countless times. I know you as you're, you're a, a lawyer that uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, regularly, I suppose, have uh, as clients who, who've been deprived of citizenship. Can you just talk me through uh, this law and what it entails and what the government is intending to do for this new bill that the government doesn't already have in terms of provisions? Okay, so if you could indulge me and, and then just give me a few minutes, and I'll, 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 I think it's important to understand the background to yeah. where this comes from. Yeah. Um, so deprivation of citizenship uh, as a power comes in in 1914 so that's that's where this mm. starts and it's really in a, it's, it's, a hist, it's a hysterical reaction to the world war and the possibility that there might be british german citizens who could be you know essentially um you know double agents or or acting as spies for 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 germany and based in the uk so that's the first point where it comes in and it's used for that specific purpose to strip away citizenship from dual british german nationals during the war um, thereafter, it, it, it remains on the statute book to, to and it's, it's, it's rarely used, I think, on 10 occasions thereafter. Then between 1973 and 2003, three decades, there's not a single instant of an individual being deprived of their citizenship. Now, the threshold, the test at that point was whether you'd engaged in conduct, which essentially was treasonous conduct, uh, siding with the, the enemy against the crown, um, that kind of activity. Now, bear in mind, this is the height of the, the period of the Cold War. Um, there's a period of the Irish Troubles with bombs going off left, right and centre in, in mainland UK. And there's, you know, no one, there's no incident of anybody being deprived of their citizenship. Now, then comes the War on Terror. And this is where things change. So after, um, you know, people are looking, every country then began looking after the war, the 9-11 attacks for their own Osama bin Laden, essentially. And in this country, they conveniently managed to identify uh, a preacher at the time who many of your older viewers would be familiar with, older listeners would be familiar with, called Abu Hamza al-Nusri, um, who is a Egypt, British Egyptian national who had been living in the UK for about two decades at that point, or if not longer. Now, he was an easy uh, figure to hate upon. Um, he had a disability with several disabilities. He didn't have hands, he had prosthetic hooks instead of hands. He was blind in one eye, so he wore an eye patch. So he essentially had that pantomime foreign character. He used to dress in Islamic garments. And to add to that, he said very controversial stuff, um, which probably broke some laws, um, and for which he was eventually convicted. Now, the issue was that after 9-11, their tabloid media, there was a lot of hysteria to get rid of this man, to deport him. He's a threat to our security, although by that point he hadn't, to, to, you know, there was the police, the prosecution service couldn't find anything to actually charge him with. Um, and the problem with deporting him is that he was, as I said, he's a dual British Egyptian national, so you'd have to first take away his citizenship. So when they look at the legislation, well, he hasn't engaged in any treasonous activity, he hasn't sided with the enemy, despite his you know, inflammatory rhetoric. Um, so what can we do? So 
thereupon they passed new legislation which effectively changed the citizenship stripping powers. So instead of the category of, of conduct about engaging in treasonous or uh, siding with the enemy, instead of that, they replaced it with a general catch-all term that if you acted in a way that was uh, seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the United Kingdom. Um, and so this was a general catch-all term. And the fact that this law came in specifically for Abu Hamza was that within three days of its passing, he was the first person targeted with it. In fact, if you look at the parliamentary debates um, on Hansard at the time, there's a lot of discussion about whether it's going to be used against Abu Hamza. So it's, you know, in, in, in legal circles, we call this the Hamza Amendment because it was very clear who it was targeted against. Um, the other change that came in in 2002-03 was that for the first time ever, the deprivation power could not be just used against naturalized citizens, people who came to the UK and became British after a period of time, but against people who were born in the UK and born as British citizens in the UK on the basis that they were dual citizens because of the, their ancestral heritage, whether that's from Bangladesh, Nigeria, or Zimbabwe, or wherever. Even if they didn't actually have citizenship of those countries? Well, so the point being is that they, under the nationality legislation of those countries, they would have had citizenship. Uh -huh. So, for example, if I take my example, my, my children were born in the UK, they're British citizens um, by virtue of their mom, but because I'm an Irish citizen, they are automatically Irish citizens as well. Whether we've applied for passports is a different thing, whether they've ever been to Ireland is a different thing, but the point is they are Irish citizens. Um, and also they'd be Pakistani citizens, although they whether they know it or not, because of their grandparents. So you, you have this, you know, the, the nationality law of that country impacts them. Now, if my son was to grow up and then be deemed um, a person on, in non grata in this country, they could deprive him the basis that he's also an Irish citizen and a Pakistani citizen, he could just, you know, go to one of those countries. So that's the law that changes in 2002. Now, it's barely used, after Abu Hamza, it's used on maybe, you know, a handful of other people, very, very sparingly used. Now, one of the people that, that it, they did try to use it on um, was David Hicks. So David Hicks was an Australian national who was detained in Guantanamo Bay. Australia wanting much to intervene in his case. The British government had, at, by that point, successfully intervened to secure the release of its citizens from Guantanamo Bay. So David Hicks' mum, who was born in the UK and lived there as a child, and in fact his granddad fought for Britain in the World War. So he wanted to apply to register as a citizen based upon on, 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 that, on that background, and the government resisted. And he won this case in the High Court. He won his case in the Court of Appeal. And so the government was forced to register him as a citizen. What they said, though, is they said that, look, if, if we register you, we're going to deprive you anyway, because you've acted in a way seriously prejudicial to the vital interests of the UK. Problem was, is that action happened uh, before the new law came into place. So those actions go back to 2000 and 2001. So, you know, by 2003, he was already in Guantanamo. So he, they couldn't rely on this. Meanwhile, while this legal battles are going on, they're fast-tracking new laws into place, which is the 2006 Act. And what this does will change the test completely to, and this is the one that's on the books at the moment. If, you, if the Secretary of State uh, believes or assesses that uh, deprivation is conducive to the public good. So it's a very broad, broad thing. There's no definition of this on the books. It's all up to the Secretary of State. So literally, by the, by the time his citizenship, he's registered as a citizen because they lost the, the two cases in the, in the courts. Within two hours or three hours, they've deprived him again under the new laws, saying that now we believe that you're, it's, it's conducive to the public good. So he's a citizen for all of like two or three hours, and then they deprived him. Um, it is a case of the government, you know, losing cases in court and then throwing its you know, toys out of the, out of the pram. Um, in a fit and um, bringing new laws into place. Now, this new definition of conducive to the public good, the current government has defined this in its policy as encompassing everything from treason to national security to serious organized crime and to what they term unacceptable behaviors. So you can see how broad that is. Now, 
Um, there is one provision of international law which the UK subscribes to is that you cannot deprive somebody if it means it would leave them without any nationality, it would leave them stateless. That would be illegal. Um, in 2014, there was an Iraqi man, a dual British Iraqi national, Hilal al Jeddah. He got, um, he was caught in Iraq and they wanted to take away his citizenship because they said he was involved in, in activity against the British government or the British army in Iraq. When it came to taking away his citizenship, at that point, he didn't have Iraqi nationality at that point. So they deprived him. He said, I've been left stateless. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the British government said, well, he used to have Iraqi nationality, so he can apply for it again. And the Supreme Court said, well, that might be the case, but at the moment he's, he's stateless. When you make your order, you've left him stateless. So having lost that case, they brought in a new act in 2014, which allowed them to take away the citizenship of naturalized citizens, even if they left them stateless, as long as they could, they reasonably believed they could access another citizenship in the future. Um, so now this is basically the, the way the government is reacting each time. Around this time, 2013-14, the deprivation, the use of the deprivation power increases significantly to the extent that in 2017, 104 people in a single year are deprived uh, by Amber Rudd. The current clause, what they're seeking to do uh, come, is to take away your citizenship without giving, any, giving you notice, without telling you that they've deprived you of that citizenship. And this again comes because they lost the case um, in the High Court and, and more recently they've lost the appeal as one well of the Court of Appeal. And this involves uh, a lady in the Syrian camps and who's named a D4. Now D4 uh, claimed her lawyers uh, contacted the Home Office or the Foreign Office to ask the Foreign Office to help repatriate her to the UK. They were then informed by the foreign officer, well, we can't because she's no longer a citizen. She was deprived on such and such a date. And uh, we didn't know where she was. So we served the notice on file, meaning they signed it and they put it into her file in the home office. So no one actually knows. They didn't send it to her last known address, to her parents' address. They knew she was in the camp. They could have served it on the Kurdish administrators, but they didn't do that. So she successfully argued, well, that's not notice, um, you know, and, and I've won my case and she, I, I should win my case because the deprivation order is null and void. And the High Court and the Court of Appeal have both said that what the Home Office is now, cons you know, it is unlawful what they've done because it's not notice. And if they do want to have this power, they need to legislate for it, which is what they're doing through Clause 9 of the National Indian Borders Bill. It's, it's, it's there for all to see. I mean, the, the judges have explicitly said what the government is doing because it's a pattern, as you've seen. The pattern that starts with Abu Hamza and ends with D4 and will carry on, that every time they lose in court, they, they make things more difficult and they introduce more draconian powers. Now, in the point of basically whether we should be afraid, in one sense we should, because over approximately 500 people have lost their citizenship in the last 20 years compared to zero in the previous three decades. Furthermore, the trajectory has gone from something like, um, are you, it's an audio, so you want me to see what I'm doing, but it, it, it's, it's increased rapidly in the last you know, five or six years. That's where the bulk of the deprivations have taken place. When you look at uh, what we've been talking about extremism and how broadly that is defined and how conducive to the public good in, includes unacceptable behaviors and serious organized crimes, you can see how you know, this, this power can potentially be used to criminalize uh, political expression of Islam to the extent that they will take away your citizenship. So it's, it is time to be worried. I don't think it, I, I don't agree with the new statesman assessment that 6 million people are gonna lose their citizenship. Uh, I don't agree that we should now just refrain from being involved in any political activity and, and, and being ourselves. I think it will be used, uh, but it's not China. We're not living in China and uh, we're, to make a point, they will, uh, you know, detain millions of people, uh, and that's how they, they make their point. We're living in, in, in a liberal democracy, which where they take a smaller group of people and public a public example of them in order to instill that same level of fear amongst the public, that this could happen to me. And you can see that in how they dealt with, or most recently, Shamima Begum, who everybody can see was 
is not a threat to the UK. I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone, even on the right wing, they can see this, that she is not a threat. She is... A, but, but also, also if, if, if she, with Shimi Begum, if she, even if she was a threat, bring her home and prosecute her. That would be how you protect the public, surely. Well, well the, you know, the, the interesting thing about that is that at, at Sajid Javid, when he was Home Secretary, he had the, I'm sure you're familiar with, when he did his complex mm -hmm. policy document, and in it he identified a case of a, what they call jihadi bride, being, uh, coming forward in Syria or in the camps, how they would treat them. And it's very, very it's set out in step by step, how they would deal with them, they would issue them with what's called a temporary exclusion order, manage her return, check if she's con con uh, commit any criminal activity, social services would get involved to check if there's any uh, you know, harm to the ch children on their best uh, interest or welfare. Um, and then they, did, they just put her on de-radicalization courses. This was the step-by-step -step process. Now, suddenly when he presented with that opportunity, um, there's a you know, a Tory party leadership contest in on the horizon. Yeah, I was going to say this. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to be seen to be tough, and then he just ignores his own policy that he's, he's drafted and signed off, and uh, he decides to deprive her of her citizenship. And for me personally, we haven't seen the statistics of that year of his time as Home Secretary, but I think he only deprived two people of their citizenship. And um, I guess I'll be, I'll have to see when the statistics are finally released, I'm right about this. Oh, they were both politically motivated. One was Shamima Begum, who, you know, it was com it's a completely ridiculous decision. And the second one, I believe, was Jack Letts, who, mm. again, for so long was not deprived of his citizenship. He was a dual Canadian British national. Um, unlike everybody else, he was a white, uh, he was white. And um, it was argued, and uh, we were litigating this in court at the time, that in another case that this policy is discriminatory doesn't apply to white people and um, in the midst of, I think possibly a month before we got to trial then the news came out that they had deprived Jack Letts which sort of took the wind out of our sails in court but uh, it's clearly arbitrary I mean the way it was used and we believe I mean I, I believe personally that it was again politically motivated because the discussion the debate had risen to the point where people were talking about whether deprivation was being used in a discriminatory manner um, I believe it clearly was. I don't think of it. I can think of many other examples of white people, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, who have been involved in terrorism and serious organized crime of a similar level, who haven't lost their citizenship. Um, and I think Jack Letts was an unfortunate uh, byproduct of our success in raising that point. But so, with I mean, those two, so two two people denied citizenship that that we know of um, under Sajid Javid, but. Not forgetting as well. I don't know if if this counts as a third, but either way, it's it was it was it's horrific and tragic. But Shamima Begum's young baby that only lived for a few days has potentially a third there because you know she she and, and it was 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 clearly demonstrated that because it was didn't it wasn't it just after Sajid Javid had said oh and in any case it would be impossible to bring her home and then another I think it was Crispin Blunt another MP appeared in the same refugee camp saying no it's it's fine to, like we can easily get here um yeah horrific so I mean and and just to make that point that, that you made for other people is that that Sandra Javid Home Secretary was this was just at the time that he launched his campaign for leadership of the Conservative Party and um so in fact he was not posturing to the whole the whole pop British population he was posturing to the 100,000 members of the Conservative Party who would vote in that in that election. Um, hence, you got sort of at that time, a lot, of, a lot of politicians making some very, very far right moves to try and appeal to that very small part of the electorate on the right. Uh, uh, how much is this then down to politics? And how much is it just down to a few uh, members of the Conservative Party who may be uh, involved in in you know electing uh, the next leader. I mean, it, it does seem to me that um, broader sentiment across the UK is now uh, ha has hardened. I mean, the Brexit vote probably indicates that has hardened towards migrants in general, but also Muslims and and you know much of what we've discussed today has fed that narrative that there are extremists within the midst and. Um, I wonder whether equally for any Labour government in, in the future, and you know, you, you know, we 
we have our uh, our questions about Keir Starmer, but how much would any government now have to continue this uh, this trajectory of of passing laws that uh, just make it even more difficult for the Muslim community? Um, I mean, we've seen uh, maybe Francis further down the road, and of course, Francis uh, t- the, the style of Francis secularism is is much different to that of the uk but we do have politicians like macron who who don't come from the right in in french politics who are now uh, echoing um some of the most uh, egregious policies of of um uh, that france has seen when it comes to dealing with the muslim community how much i suppose is is the politic has now set in in this direction that you can't win votes if you're going to be uh, rational and and fair-minded when it comes to the Muslim community, Rob. I think. I think. You know. So. So is 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 the cat out of the bag? Have they opened Pandora's box against Muslims, and therefore do all politicians to be elected have to follow that 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 path? Um, I think yes, yes, and no. I think. I mean, one of the great tragedies uh, is what happened to Jeremy Corbyn, to a lesser extent Bernie Sanders in the states, where. You've got you had a politician who was who was fighting against that, who was arguing for something radically different, um, and did actually have a huge amount of popular support. But the the press and the political classes turned against them, um, and effectively just des- destroyed them. Um, and I personally, I I have a sort of personal connection to this because I, when I was a union rep in Finsbury Park in a school, um, Jeremy Corbyn was way before his kind of ele- he became leader of the, of the Labour Party. Um, was hugely supportive in some really difficult industrial actions, and you know, I think probably anyone that lives in Islington North would have a similar similar thing to say about him. He's a very very good man. Um, so so, but I think that, I think there is some hope because if you look at the um, if you look at the uh, electoral statistics by age, then as more young people start to vote, um, it, it does seem that the, the that, I mean, bear in mind that Jeremy Corbyn only just lost when there was a massive, massive national campaign to slum him. I mean, you, you can't exaggerate how big that campaign was to destroy the man um, with just lies every night for a year on the, on the news, every every day for a year and the national newspapers lies about him. Um, and he still got very close. I think, uh, um, just following off what Rob said, it's it's not going to go down that that route um, as far as I'm concerned. But what it does do is it it sort of underlines them telling uh, you know communities that you don't belong here, you never have belonged. I think that's that is a fundamental issue that it's a take home point for us, um, and it's a deliberate take home point. It's it's intended to tell us that you guys are not British. You never have been. No matter if you're you know I'm dealing with a third generation. British national at the moment who lost his citizenship. He was born here, his dad was born here, his granddad immigrated here, you know, so, but he's lost his citizenship on the basis of, well, you're still from that other country without naming it, but that that's essentially it. He's like, you never have belonged here. We've let you in because of historical issues that have gone on and you've managed to get in here, but, you know, you're not British and don't ever feel comfortable in the knowledge in, in, that you that you're never going to be removed, it's like that conversation many of our parents had uh, that we always have to go back home someday. I mean, back home in Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, wherever, and um, there's always an eye over there. And just where this generation sort of feels, well, no, this is our home, and this is where we we are, and we've been living, and we've been educated, and we support the football team. You know, it even got to that point where people are supporting the football team, but even then. No, don't don't get too comfortable, and you know I I, I know of people now who are one step ahead. Uh, friends of mine, uh, people I know who have actually are buying properties, you know, in other countries, are setting up bank accounts, are putting in that contingency plan, um, and even if their citizenship is not removed, they are looking to relocate to somewhere where they feel a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. Um, and where you had this sort of talk about hijra in the past and, and uh, for Islamic reasons, now it's more just sort of accepting the reality that do we want to raise our, our, the next generation in a place where they never really would be accepted 
or do we want to go to a place where they'll feel that sense of belonging, that sense of identity, that place where they can't be kicked out of when they get older? Um, and that is a net effect of all of these policies and laws. Yeah, I, I, on speaking to that, I remember quite a few of my Muslim colleagues when I was in Friends who, when kind of Prevent got introduced, they, they, they used to joke about how, how their dad had kept some property back in Bangladesh for when we get kicked out. And then suddenly prevent came in. They're like, oh, <laughs> he was like, we're not going to joke about that anymore. We've got property in Bangladesh. Rob Fall Walker, uh, Fahad Ansari, it's been, an, it's been a pleasure speaking to you two today. And uh, thank you very much uh, for shedding light on some of these policies. And uh, in, uh, Rob, do you have any, any uh, further works coming out? What's your, what's, what's coming after this book? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm based at UCL now. I'm working on, um, <laughs> well, I'm, I, after, after, after a depressing few years um, writing about extremism, I'm actually writing about, I won't go into the details of it, but write, writing about love um, and how that can be enacted <laughs> through critique. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, it, and it's making me a bit happier than this, but uh, yeah, less, I'm less angry. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm still, you know, you can't, you can't ignore what's going on with, with preventing counter extremism. So I'm still very much keeping an eye on that through, you know, I maintain Prevent Digest news, that sort of things like that. And Fahad, you made reference to your professional work looking at the uh, citizenship deprivation orders. Do you believe that's just going to continue and, and become far more uh, common that uh, Muslim citizens uh, will be deprived of their citizenship? I do. I mean, sadly, I think in the, the foreseeable future, this power is on the, on the, the statute books. Uh, we currently have a government and a home secretary who are drunk on power and uh, are willing to use that as and when they may. Um, and I think there'll be a, there'll definitely be an increase in use of it. Um, but when it comes to, you know, just use of that policy, if you can imagine the amount of, uh, you know, children who get involved in, in, in gang violence, in gang crimes, in drug-related activity, who come from ethnic backgrounds, you know, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Somali, um, whatever it may be, they are, it, it can potentially be used against them. All it needs is that level of public hysteria. So if you remember a few years back before sort of pan the pandemic hit, there was a lot of hysteria about knife crime in London. Um, you know, and they're talking about, you know, black gangs and it was very, very racialized see the, the coverage of it. Now, all you need to do is add that sort of ethnic dimension to that and you have a power that can be used and you've got a home secretary who wouldn't blink about using it. And then you have a precedent that's established. And, uh, you know, you, so I, I do fear that it will be used in that sense. One of the things I'm currently trying to work on is, is just to try to write up something on the human aspect of this and uh, the human impact of when you get deprived uh, from my client's perspective and, and interviewing them is what happens? I mean, you know, it, it, you, you lose and you appeal, but what's the human factor? What, you're stuck in a foreign jurisdiction you don't have a travel document, you don't have an income, you don't have papers, what's going through your mind? So hopefully, inshallah, um, at some point this year, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get that complete.